Hello, everybody. This is Joshua Hatton with One Nation Under Whiskey Podcast. I'm joined this season and every season with the one and only Jason Neil Johnston Yellen. Hiya, Jason. Hello. Welcome to season seven. Season seven? That's a number. <laughs> it is a number. <laughs> it is a number. But does it does it feel seven years ago that we both came to one another and said, hey, let's do a thing? It's it's another one of those time moments, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Does, does it feel like seven? No. Does it feel like something else? No. Does it feel like time has passed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Does it seem measurable by any metric? No. 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 Kind of. I mean, if I were to just pick a number out the sky, the number that feels comfortable around this is is three for me. Oh wow! Yeah, it feels it feels only three seasons <laughs> in for me, despite us being <laughs> seven seasons now into our seventh season. Yeah. Wow, that's significant. Yeah, well, yeah. I do still remember Mm -hmm. sitting on Sturk's casting couch (laughs) and answering uh, questions that made me feel uncomfortable. Or perhaps that's his (laughs) position. Maybe he answered questions that made him feel uncomfortable. He was on our casting couch. Right? In his building. In his building. Isn't it funny that we had a casting couch in his building? I'll never forget that day. I remember going there and he turned on the record player and put on Yes, Close to the Edge because he knew how much I loved that album. And he was like, Joshua, you're going to love this. And he just blasted Yes, Close to the Edge. We talked about, we got to taste, uh, what did we get to do? We got to taste caramel coloring for the first time. I still have that little, (laughs) that little container of caramel coloring. Oh, from like, the handle of a teaspoon. Yeah. I'm like, Why do you have this? I've got a client who wants it. That poor client. <laughs> they got what they wanted. They did get There's what no they doubt wanted. about it. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. And back then, what our first episode was 40 something minutes. 43 tight, minutes. It was almost a tight 35 back in the day. <laughs> yeah, it was 43 minutes. I, I feel it was 43 minutes. And we felt <laughs> that that was going to be it. But like, like we can't go beyond 45 minutes. Like, what else is there to talk about? How else are we going to a conduct a conversation? Now we don't have a, an interview, or we rarely have an interview that's less than 45 minutes. Which I think is better, right? These, I don't know about I you, but so. I really enjoyed long-form so. discussions. I think so. Yeah. You could cut all everything around the interview, but yeah, I, I like the interview. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's right. We do record more of ourselves than we do the actual interview, as evidenced by this intro. <laughs> You're not the first person to comment on that. <laughs> wow. We call those favors. Well, can I, can I do this, Joshua? All right. You can do anything. This is America, Jason. It, it, it's, it's, it's apropos. Given what we just said about, oh, yes, we do record more of ourselves than we do the, the interviewee. Um, I, have an, I have an email to share at the start of season seven. Is this, so are you setting a precedent or are you just deciding no. to change it up in the no, bedroom just, a little bit? Well, for today? the reason I want, to, I want to introduce this person because it shows that there are people listening to this, mm. which I think is important. So this came into the info at Single Cast Nation account um, and the, the, the person in charge of the account that day actually got a pronunciation. So I can tell you <laughs> that we got an email from, well, let's play our usual game, Joshua. Here's a second name for you that I will spell. So okay. cast this to your mind's okay. eye. Shoot. You're going to love how it starts. P F E I Michelle Pfeiffer F F L E. (laughs) Do you have that in your mind's eye? So at first I thought it was Michelle Pfeiffer, (laughs) and then you kept going. So P F Yep 
E I F L E. Yep. Fifle, Fifle. Catwoman. So. So this is Ryan, and Ryan says, My ancestors were apparently illiterate because it is pronounced Fifely. Oh, d- did I get close at all? Did I say Fifely? I think <laughs> you I said can Fifley. listen back to the, okay, to, the yeah. raw, <laughs> to the raw audio. All right, so, um, so go on. So Ryan, Ryan Fifely writes in to say, Love the podcast. I have Thank been you. listening while building our single malt distillery on our farm in Montana. Ah. The building is up, stills are nearly finished, and the SS equipment is in a shipping container. (laughs) SS equipment? (laughs) While I won't have any of our whiskey to sell for many years... Mm -hmm. I want to make you aware of my friends who were the first single malt distillery in Argentina. Ah, okay. And then I'm I'm looking at a URL that looks like La Alazana whiskey. I've heard of them through uh, through Drammers, I want to say, or through someone. Yeah, at a Drammers meeting. Yeah, sorry. Go on. Yeah, so he he goes on, super passionate and interesting people. In the future, we will be doing Northern-Southern Hemisphere collaborations. Mm. Please check them out. We plan to import some of their spirit in the fall. So La Alazana coming from Argentina in the fall. There's then a a few photos. And then uh, the info account wrote back to say, you know, hey, Love to cover this, you mm-hmm. know, on the, on the podcast. We'll share this with with the guys, and uh, and and how do you pronounce your name? Because you know they'll screw it up. Which <laughs> hence hence we played the game today, uh, and so Ryan wrote back, fantastic about about uh, you know it, the email being received. In all honesty, uh, thanks so much for the response. I'm not necessarily looking for a mention. Just wanted to say hi and hope maybe we can collaborate in the future. Mm. Which you know. Always makes me think of our, our friends Lee and Brie Atwood oh, down in Yak and Danda with yeah. Lee in the Stillhouse listening to the podcast and now, you know, the relationship we've got there. So, you know, Montana is, is years in the future. Um, but then, he, and then he, Ryan adds that kind of interesting thing that you and I talk about mm. on and off. <laughs> First of all, he says, forgot to mention that I lived a year in Scotland, the year 2007, Joshua, if you can cast your mind back oh, wow. to the year 2007. That and he lived in Scotland that. before coming back to the farm. And he says, I was fascinated by how the Scotch climate and culture created their whiskey. Mm. Now it's my mission to see what kind of whiskey will result from my farm and our climate. Did you say that he he found it fascinating that it wasn't just your climate, but but the Scottish culture that made the exactly. whiskey? Exactly, climate really and culture. Like yeah, isn't that a good observation there? It really is. It really is. I like that. Um, you know, it makes me think. W- I've been to Montana once. I drove through it. I remember coming over. This was nineteen ninety six driving over a hill dead of night and seeing the city of Butte, Montana just lit mm-hmm. up, just mm-hmm. lighting up the night mm-hmm. sky and getting gas there and then and then moving on. But I really didn't have much experience of Montana driving through. That's big sky country, though. You know, I wonder what the culture mm-hmm. is like mm-hmm. there, just big, open, wilderness kind of feel. I wonder what that's going to do to to his right. whiskeys. Warm summers, yeah. cold winters. Yeah. Um, Missoula, Montana is a real cool little town. Oh, all right. You've been. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Worth, worth hanging out in, uh, over there. Good pizza. Real good pizza. Oh, go easy, Jason. Is that where the... Some of my boys, they were so happy. Is that where the, um, dental floss tycoon lives? He moved to Montana to become a dental floss tycoon? I don't know if any part of this is a joke or He's, reality, or I don't know what we're referencing. He right uses now. zircon encrusted tweezers to 
to lift up the the dental floss, and he lifts it up. He waxes it up. I do, what have I? Is this real? Have I, what have I missed? What, what are you riffing off of in Missoula? Every Montana? single Frank Zappa fan listening to this oh right now. Lord. Moving oh to my Montana Lord. soon. Gonna be a dental floss tycoon. <laughs> yeah. There you go, baby. <laughs> oh, we're deep into Zappa. Now there's a Venn, ga- a Venn diagram I wouldn't mind seeing. Those, those who remember and understand and have memorized the Frank Zappa catalog and those who listen to One Nation Under Whiskey. There might be one person out there right now no, loving this. No, no I, I highly disagree. What's the number one music that we hear people who are into scotch whiskey listen to what what's what's the big one <laughs> prog rock prog rock and jazz and what's frank zappa <laughs> that plus so much more i guarantee there's there's plenty of people men and women listening to zappa listening to our podcast drinking our whiskey drinking someone else's whiskey i guarantee it <laughs> Oh, well, listen, I'm, I'm going to circle back to Ryan's oh, email yeah, <laughs> later in the episode. Okay. Because I, I don't want to derail us too far before we get into transitioning to Victoria Edie Butler and uh, the time we spent with her. Yeah, brilliant. That, that was such a wonderful conversation to be having with Victoria. Just so lovely. Just such an easy conversation, hearing her story, hearing her family's story, and some of the mm-hmm. history and connections to, to Jack Daniels. And yeah, yeah, I thought it was fascinating. And, and I kind of agree with you. We can easily derail things, we can easily take focus, but why not put focus onto our conversation with Victoria? Victoria, thank you again so much for for joining us. As we mentioned before we hit record, um, you were a person that Jason and I wanted to have on the podcast for a while. And when Amanda Katz reached out to us and said that you were interested in being in our on our pad yeah, podcast, see that Jason? I said podcast instead of podcast. Um, That's an inside it, joke, at least. <laughs> It felt like kismet. It felt like something that was meant to be. So, so truly, th- thank you for uh, for joining us. Mm-hmm. Um, you may or may not be tired of telling your origin story, because because I f- I feel it's it's quite out there, right? It's it's been great over the past five years or so, reading more and more about Uncle Nearest and and your whiskeys and your evolving story, but for those that are listeners of the podcast, they may not know of the Uncle Nearest story. I wonder if you could talk about uh, the origins, your your own connection as the great-great-granddaughter of of Nathan Green uh, or Uncle Nearest. Um, that, that, that would be a great way to set the table, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, I don't mind at all. And, and I never grow old, grow tired of sharing the story. Oddly enough, there are still uh, so many people who uh, don't know our story. And so uh, I never grow tired of sharing it. So thank you. Thank you for having me on uh, today. I'm, I'm really glad to be here with you to uh, share the story and, and talk about whatever you guys have on your heart to talk about. So uh, in regards Cheers. to um, our history, our story, how we started, um, I can't take credit for that. Our CEO and founder, um, her name is Fawn Weaver. She is a brilliant, caring, generous woman who I have grown to love quite deeply. Uh, Our relationship is um, one that I cherish dearly. Uh, But Fawn was on a trip in 2016 with her husband when she picked Hmm. up the New York Times and sees this story about a once enslaved man who taught a young Jack Daniel how to distill. Uh, The article goes into Hmm. a little bit of their relationship. That article intrigued Fawn to want to know more about Nearest Green. And so she Googled and researched and really couldn't find anything. 
And so she decided that she would go to Lynchburg, Tennessee to try to uncover more about this story. And Mm -hmm. she felt in her spirit even then that there was a a, a relationship there that was unknown, uh, unheard of during a time of of, uh, racial tension in our country, um, during a time when um, a slave, an enslaved man um, got the same treatment as a white man. Um, in regards mm. to um, relationship with this this young white boy. And so she wanted to know more about Nearest Green. And so she mm-hmm. arrives in Lynchburg in 2016, and she puts together a team of, of 20 individuals um, that included uh, genealogists and historians and such to help her uncover what we now know to be the, the legacy, uh, the history of Nears Green, my great great grandfather. Yeah. Um, now she knew that Nears had a relationship with Jack Daniel. That article, of course, stated that. But during the course of the research, she learned that Nears Green arrived in Tennessee in the mid 1800s. She mm. found that he was born sometimes around 1820. We believe 1820. Uh, in Maryland, and at some point was transported to uh, Tennessee. And he was working on a farm for a preacher named Dan Call. Now, Dan Call, (laughs) true enough, was a preacher, but he was also selling whiskey, and Nears Green is the man (laughs) who was making it for him. Hmm. And Uh, on that farm, a young white boy arrived when he was about seven or eight years old, And he obviously was a curious lad because uh, the research shows that he kept asking Dan Call about what was going on in the distance from the house. He wanted to know what was what was happening over there. And knowing the story now, I can imagine there was a lot of commotion uh, where (laughs) Nears was making the whiskey. There was smoke, likely even music and and people talking and so this young boy wanted to know what was happening. And so finally Dan mm-hmm. Call gives in and he takes him to meet Nearest Green. And he introduces Nearest Green to a young Jack Daniel and says that Nearest Green is the best whiskey maker around. And indeed he was. Wow. Uh, through Fawn's research, she learned that Nearest was responsible for um, helping to perfect what is known as the Lincoln County process. That is the process of filtering whiskey through sugar maple charcoal. Uh, We believe that that innovation was brought over from our people in West Africa. Uh, It is still used Uh today to purify water. And so we just believe that Nearest in his infinite wisdom thought if it worked for water, it would also work for whiskey. And indeed it did, and still does. Mm. In 2013, (laughs) the governor of Tennessee signed into law that any whiskey designed to be Tennessee whiskey must meet all the qualifications of bourbon, but it also Mm -hmm. has to be made in Tennessee, and it must adhere to the Lincoln County process. And so that makes Nears Green the godfather of Tennessee whiskey. Without that invention, that um, that method, Tennessee whiskey would just be another spirit. But because of what Nears um, helped perfect, Tennessee whiskey is in a category of its own. And so when Fawn was learning all of this out, she was sharing with my family along the way, mm-hmm. you know, um, because when she arrived in Tennessee, she she started meeting Jack's, Jack Daniels' relatives, certainly uh, yeah. Nearest Green's descendants, and, of course, the townspeople of Lynchburg. And through the, the time that she was doing the research, um, uh, more than 10,000 artifacts rolled into her. And so... Uh, people were very generous and in, in, in forthright in sharing information 
Um, mm. The team that she assembled were um, dedicated to finding out all they could about uh, this man that no one knew about. And so Fawn was sharing with the family and during the course of one of our meetings, she asked the family, you know, knowing what we know now about Nearest making history of his own, uh, not just mm. being an enslaved man who made whiskey for uh, Dan Call and not just having a, a, this beautiful, unheard of relationship with Jack Daniel, but he also made history of his own. In addition to helping to perfect the Lincoln County process, he also became the first known African-American master distiller. And so wow. Nears was a history maker, right? Uh, he was innovative and creative. And so Fawn deemed it necessary to pay homage to this man that uh, no one knew about for more than 160 plus years. And so she asked the family, you know, what would you guys like to see happen? And one of the family members said, we'd like to see his name on a bottle. Now, keep in mind that when Fawn rolled into Tennessee in 2016, it was not with the idea of making whiskey. Uh, Fawn is certainly a brilliant woman. She's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, she's a New York Times bestselling author. But making whiskey was not on the agenda. Uh, the thought then was... Uh, perhaps she would gather as much information as she could about Nears, learning all she could about him, meeting mm. his family. Uh, she had already formed the Nears Green Foundation that uh, supports Nears's bloodline descendants in going to college. Uh, we pay for uh, full tuition, all fees, and books related to their college classes. Mm. But she wanted to do more for the family, right? And yeah. so when the thought of making whiskey was posed, she said, why not? And uh, <laughs> she reached in to Catherine Jerkins, who is now our chief business officer, and a few other people along the way. You know, we, she started adding to the team. And in 2017, mm -hmm. the first bottle of Uncle Nears premium whiskey rolled off the line and on to... Um, onto the shelves of bars and, and, and liquor stores. Naturally, I'm giving you the condensed version. Um, uh, as you might imagine, Fawn and the handful of people that uh, started to pound the rock every day um, leading up to our launch in 2017, they put in a mm. lot of work. There were a sure, lot man. of long days and nights and um, hurdles to cross especially with her being um, an African-American woman uh, and wanting mm. to honor an African-American man. Um, there were some hurdles to cross, but Fawn took all of that in stride and used it to her adv advantage. And now mm. here we are, five years later, we are the fastest growing American spirit in history we are the most awarded whiskey or bourbon for the last three years. And shortly we will be announcing that we also are the most awarded for 2022 as well. Uh, we are the wow. only major uh, whiskey brand that is owned and led by an African-American woman. The only um, major whiskey um, or spirit brand that is honoring an African-American man and we mm -hmm, have the mm -hmm. first and i think only all female executive team that that's something i noticed as i was that i as i was reading some of the backstory i said each name this is a female there's another it female is. and another it and, and, is now i'll be yeah. uh, extremely transparent there is no secret yeah. uh here when fawn was putting the team together she didn't actively seek out to build uh, an all-female exec executive team. What she mm -hmm. sought and continues to seek every day is when we add to the team, is to fill it with the best person for the position. And for sure. us, it ended up being all-females for the executive team. And 
now that we are here, we have embraced the fact that we are uh, the first all-female executive team, um, and we do one hell of a job in in going about um, being good examples of being the first, but we certainly hope that we are not the last, right? Um, We are, um, we strive every day, the Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey team, not just the executive team, but the whole team. We strive every day to be good stewards of what we have Mm -hmm. worked hard for and what we have been blessed to uh, achieve and receive. And so while we have broken um, the glass ceiling, so to speak, uh, as being the first on several different uh, things, we certainly don't want to be the last. And so it is our motto and something that we live by and something Fawn does every day is to pull as we climb, to help others mm. in the same um, industry, you know, in this spirits industry that we are working hard to make more diverse. Uh, our team is extremely um, diverse. We have black, white, young, old, gay, straight. We look like the face of America, and we are very proud of go. that. We are very proud of that. I've I've so many different places to go with questions here, but just on this very topic, one of the things we dip in and out of is gatekeeping. Yes. And, and the, the fact that you just said they are, you know, and, and I've already forgotten the exact words, but, you know, li- lifting up while pulling through, pulling up while, you know, blazing a trail. Yeah. Like there's so much conversation around the work that's being done that speaks of community, that speaks of people. And and one of the things that, as I mentioned, we're always grappling with here is gatekeeping. You've got this wonderful natural story that's talking about disempowered people and you're lending empowerment to that. Generally speaking, as an industry, do you have thoughts on how gatekeeping can be done better by those of us who who don't have as natural a story? Is that something you concern yourself with? Is that something you think about? Are you busy blazing your own trail? No, no. You know, I think we, we always have to be concerned about others, not just ourselves. You know, making our industry more diverse is certainly uh, one of the things that, that we are working towards. For many, mm-hmm. many years, uh, far too many years, as far as I'm concerned, this has been a white male dominated industry. And now mm-hmm. that is changing. Uh, I can't say that that's because of the Uncle Nears Premium Whiskey team and what we have done and and how we look, but things have definitely changed since we came on the scene, and mm-hmm. um, and we are uh, uh, glad of that. Right? There's room for all of us, not just uh, a white male, and um, so we we are proud to uh, if we are the leader in in changing that. Uh, we're proud to do so. We're proud to continue working towards making uh, the this industry that we love so much more diverse and inclusive. Well, and I wonder, I, mm. I read a piece that you'd said, and I think you alluded to it even in today's words, where the awards you're winning are tasted blind. Yes. And I got the feeling yes. in reading your words and, and hearing some of your words today that you're so proud of that aspect where there's no getting away from who you are and who the team is and what the distillery is representing. And yet the awards are awarded blind. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yes. Um, um, You know, our story is so compelling. uh, And what I love most about it is that it doesn't have to be embellished. Uh, everything that mm. we share is documented, so we don't have to embellish to make it a a real story, right? Uh, and I love that. I love that um, our team, our 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 CEO and founder, um, is transparent about everything that we do. Um, but our whiskey speaks for itself as well, and so because our story is what it is. Uh, we only submit to blind taste tests because we don't want anyone to be swayed mm. 
by this beautiful yep. story. Sure, sure. And so they taste our product blindly and we continue to knock it out the box, right? <laughs> and uh, so we're, 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 we're proud of that. Um, we do submit our product to a lot of, of uh, competitions. And um, you, we, you, we're not complacent, although we've won just, you know, I, I can't remember the number now, more than 575, I think, awards. Um, and we mm-hmm. like to continue to knock it out with a goal, double goal, best in class. So we strive every day to continue to maintain that quality um, sure, uh, of sure. winning those types of awards, but also um, continuing to put a premium uh, whiskey in the bottle for the consumers who have come to love our brand so much. And so we're privileged to be talking to the master blender of that product. So... Well, How do thank you, do you. It? thank you. I, I'm <laughs> proud of it. You know, uh, when Fawn asked me to blend that first batch of Uncle Nearest 1884 in um, uh, May of 2019, I had no idea mm-hmm. uh, where this thing would go. But now that that we are here, I just cannot imagine. Uh, doing anything else. Um, Hmm. I wanted to be a part of the team when she approached me about being a part of the team. Naturally, Mm -hmm. I said yes. You know, there's very few people, none actually that I know of, who have the opportunity to pick up a legacy and be a part of cementing that legacy, you know, after it lay dormant for more than 160 plus years. So the thought of being a part of that, it was a no brainer for me. I, I, you know, I wanted to be a part of this amazing team, this family that Fawn Weaver had created. And so saying yes was really easy. And then finding my place as a master blender, um, it has been a beautiful journey and I'm, I'm so grateful for it. So for the benefit of our listeners, you were, you were in the law enforcement world. I, I think you had ambitions to be a judge. Am I right in saying that, Victoria? Well, I didn't actually have ambitions for that. My grandmother thought, <laughs> I, I, you know, that I would be good at, at, at being a judge. I have always enjoyed talking. And so that was one of the things that she would say, you know. But uh, I didn't really have aspirations to, uh, to be okay. a judge. Now, okay. I was blessed to um, work in a field that I, I really enjoyed for almost 31 years. I felt like the work we did there um, helped to make our community safe. And, and so it was, a, it was a, a, a heavy job. It was a very important mm. job. But now um, what I'm doing is extremely important to me as well uh, to mm. be a part of continuing my great-great-grandfather's legacy to work in the same vein that he did all those years ago. Um, I just, I love it. I, I absolutely love it. I know that it is a blessing. Um, and and hmm. what when Fawn asked me to blend our first batch of 1884, I had no idea that my yes was unlocking a passion that I didn't know hmm. existed. So mm. since then, um, it's, it's just been, it's been awesome. I, I really can't explain this journey other than um, it's been a blessing. Just, just uh, an unexpected, beautiful blessing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Were you, a, were you a drinker beforehand when you were... I did. I did drink. Um, I started drinking later. You know, most of us will dab and 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 sip when we're younger. Uh, <laughs> I was a full fledged college student before I really started drinking. And um, once I uh, knew what uh, a good drink was, I enjoyed some E. H. Taylor and um, mm-hmm. Maker's mm-hmm. Mark Forty Six. They were my go tos. And I still, I guess I still like them. I haven't had them since I started, you know, drinking Uncle Nearest. But those, those were uh, the things that I enjoyed. And I still enjoy a good cold beer. There you go. Okay. 
<laughs> cools the throat after a hard day of it does. being in, it the, does. in the lab. It does. I like a good cold beer. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've got one more question just on this ilk, and then I'll let Joshua get another sure. word in edgewise. Oh, but, you're going to let me speak, Jason. That, <laughs> well, yeah. Unexpected, yeah. Victoria. Unexpected. So, as long as you're recording on your end, I'll let you have all the words you want. So, um, so I, I like it. Each time you kind of come back to when I was invited to do this blending, and, and, and here I've got this great honor, and here I've got this blessing, and here I've got this connection to family. Flavor-wise... Did you have a goal when you were facing that vatting? What were you thinking to yourself? What was what was going across your palate? And did you have flavors that that you were particularly fond of? Well, this is this is this was my thought because I didn't know anything about blending really when I went into the first session. Now, granted, I have taken plenty of classes since then, and mm -hmm. I hope to always be a student of my craft. Um, mm -hmm. in spite of winning so many awards, I do not know everything. Um, <laughs> only a foolish person thinks that, right? And, yeah, um, yeah. but, but before, you know, I blended that first batch, I did start, um, trying to learn all I could about the industry just so that I could at least have an intelligent conversation with others in the field, Right. Mm -hmm. And so I go in to blend that first batch, and my only thought was, because Uncle Nears was already a premium product, I wanted to ensure that what I did met the standard that our CEO and founder, Fawn Weaver, had put in place, and that mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. consumers were already drinking, and I wanted it to have a good finish. Those were the things that I liked about E.H. Hmm. E. Taylor and Maker's Mark 46. Hmm. Mm -hmm. The finish left me um, thinking, wow, this is an enjoyable drink. It wasn't hmm. pungent. You know, it was strong and lasting, but not pungent. And so those were my thoughts going into that first blending session is that um, I do, you know, that I do what has already been done by maintaining this quality product and that the finish be good. And so during the course of that first blending session, Fawn said she knew about midway through that I had something special. We had other teammates in there with me that had years and years of experience, right? And so when we were tasting and, 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 and writing down our notes, um, lo and behold, I, I, our notes were almost identical. And um, <laughs> so they tell me that's unheard of, right? And so um, <laughs> they were there cheering me on. I had the best, you know, the best people around me. The positive energy uh, gave me the encouragement to um, make the decisions based on my palate and uh, based mm -hmm. on what mm -hmm. I enjoyed. And thankfully, uh, what I did, um, what I chose to blend, uh, when it hit the market in July 2019, that the consumers thought that it was good as well. And so mm -hmm. uh, we started winning awards with it right out the gate. Um, gold, double gold, best in class, those types of awards that we want. And so mm -hmm. um, Fawn asked me to blend the second batch, and I did, and the awards and the accolades, they kept coming. And shortly thereafter, I was elevated to, to Master Blender, and I have blended <laughs> every batch since then. Wow. It, it, bring, I, I, it brings I, me I, perfectly to the question that I had. No, please, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, just, I was just going to add that um, I unknowingly – Love the spirits industry. Didn't know it. Didn't know that <laughs> that I just genuinely would enjoy this. Um, I love people. I enjoy meeting new people, um, talking to people. Uh, I guess you can tell. Um, <laughs> I, you know, that was one of my things. I'm big on hospitality, and uh, I'm a Southern girl to the bone, right? And so those mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. things I knew about myself, Um but I did not know that um, 
the the art of blending whiskey was uh, something that that um, I would enjoy or even consider doing. But now I know uh, I have fully embraced and um, embody that uh, whiskey is is truly in my blood. That those characteristics that my great great grandfather uh, had all those years ago in making whiskey, um, his mm. great great granddaughter has in blending whiskey, yeah. and and she loves it. I absolutely love it. Awesome. That's yeah. That's that's awesome. I love it. I, there's a, so there's a couple things in there that I wanted to touch on. The first one, really quickly, uh, I, I love how you talk about finish, and that's something that's so key to you in in a final drink. We've got a friend, and maybe you know, maybe you've met him, uh, Gene Sharness of Warehouse Liquors in Chicago, and that is the the linchpin for him. If it if the if that whiskey doesn't have a good finish, then it wasn't a good whiskey in no, the first place. No, because yeah. the finish, you know, it either makes it or break it for me. And so that's why yeah. when I'm blending, I do not spit out the product. Um, I, I learned that um, most blenders do. I did not know that. I was just, to me, it was just common sense. How do you know what the finish is if you spin it, spit it out? So yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't spit out any of our liquid gold when I am blending whiskey. Yeah. I always say my muscles don't work in that direction. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. It doesn't work in that direction. It's to swallow. <laughs> Could you, so I'm curious to know, as you were working to blend your, your first batch, your approach to it, and then as you continued on, what is your process looking like for, for blending from batch to batch? And also, you know, I imagine, and, and I could be wrong here, but, but I wonder if there's different approaches to blending, whether it's your 1884, 1820, 56, and, and so on. How do you approach that? I, it's really not a different approach. I, I, I come to each one basically the same way. Um, I don't eat, drink. Um, while I'm blending, before I'm blending, uh, I don't spit out the product. Mm. Uh, I take my time, whether it be three hours or, or, or eight. I don't uh, concentrate on what I did the last time. <laughs> my concentration is ah. making this batch, this blend, this bottle the very best that it can be. So I don't ever look back and try to make comparisons. Um, mm. I want what I'm doing right now to be the very best that it can be. So you, you're not necessarily concerned so much about consistency from batch to batch, just that each batch be... Be the best. And oddly delicious. enough, yeah. um, okay. that has worked best for, for me, for our brand, mm -hmm. but it has turned out to be consistent without me even really trying. Um, because yeah. it's my palate now, you know, uh, yeah. my palate is, um, I guess, trained uh, on mm -hmm. the 1856 or uh, when I go into blend, you know, my concentration is the 1884. And so it's been, been consistent. I don't think the average consumer, the average drinker would know, um, mm. pick up any difference in batch to batch other than maybe this single barrel that we have now but it's going to be different because mm -hmm. each barrel is different right and so yeah. uh yeah. with it being a single barrel there is no blending that that goes into that so sure. that those each each batch or each barrel uh they will be different my job for for the single barrel is pick out the very best barrel to be bottled. And um, so consistency definitely doesn't come into play there. Yeah, for sure. And, and that, that's a world that, that we're familiar with on our independent bottling side of things. Jason, I see you have a question in the chamber. Please hold it because I, I had another question. It's about process. Calm down. I got hundreds. Um, They're not going anywhere. <laughs> Oh, we know. <laughs> so you, you hear quite often about blenders taking taking the liquid, sometimes the individual components, sometimes what they hope to be the final product, 
and bring it down to like 20% alcohol or something like that to see, to ensure that everything sits in its right place. Do you blend that way or no. do you blend no. to how it's going to taste when you open up the bottle? That's how I, I taste at go. barrel strength, right. at cast strength. Yep. I'll blend it at cast strength and then we bring mm-hmm. it down. Um, as you probably know, uh, Joshua and Jason, there is very little water that goes into our whiskey, uh, whether mm-hmm. it be the 1884 or um, our 56. Uh, we just mm-hmm. don't use um, m- uh, much water. We are a high proof whiskey. Our 1884 is 93 proof. Our 1856 is 100 proof. And now mm-hmm. we have the 100 proof rye. Uh, we just put mm-hmm. very mm-hmm. little water in. We don't proof up. Um, it doesn't go in real high and then proof down, add in the water. Uh, we want each mm-hmm. bottle, each time you drink it, you get the full beauty, the full essence of the of the whiskey. So very little water goes into our whiskey uh, in the bottle. Sure. Yep, I hear you on that. Sure. Yep. Um, and then I, I had a question regarding your rye whiskey. It's it's an unusual match belt, a hundred percent rye. It is. Uh, which yeah, so you don't you don't find that happening too much so can you talk a little bit about your your rye whiskey yeah. and how um, and i also want to share that, that everything all of our expressions are um our own juice now when we first started uh we okay. were sourcing um but earlier this year the first of the year uh we started bottling our own product from from start to finish with the nice. exception of the rye that launched a few weeks ago um <laughs> Rye does oh, okay. not readily grow um, conducive for making whiskey here in Tennessee. It comes up mm-hmm. with wild onion. So um, our rye is sourced. And what we are bottling now, okay. it was an experiment in, 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 in Canada, but it was made with U.S. specs, huh. right? So um, yeah. once Fawn identified that and realized... Um, that it was made with United States with American whiskey uh, uh, specifications. She bought every bit of mm. it, mm. all of it. So oh, it is. Wow. It okay. is. Um, it starts out in Canada, then it comes to New York. It is, it is aged there, and then it is shipped to um, our distillery, and it is transferred into a Uncle Nearest barrel, and it resides in that barrel for about a month or so, and then okay. we bottle it. Mm. I, he, two things I love so much. You, you came out the gate talking about the, the story of Uncle Nearest and, and the fact that it's true. And there's, there's so many brands out there that it may have a, a made-up story. But you came out the gate with a real story. And then you came out with being very open about sourcing and yes. not all brands would be open about sourcing. So I really uh, ap- appreciate the transparency that you're showing here. And, and, and that, that led me to another question. And, and you may have already answered this when explaining how you blend, but as you were going from sourced product to your own product with the bourbon, was there a transition? Did you marry some of your own liquid with the source we did. to get you to what is now your own? We did. Yeah. We did. Um, it was just a, a gradual process. This is one of the things that we we quickly realized when we were sourcing. Uh, we were so anxious to get to our whiskey, uh, to our own, mm. because we were uh, sourcing our product. Of course, it was Tennessee-based, mm. but we were killing them in all the competitions. <laughs> and so we were just excited to get our own juice in the bottle. It was a gradual thing, but now it's, it's yeah. all it's all Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey. Uh, very <laughs> exciting for us. We did a Clear the Chef campaign earlier this year that started. Uh, we sold off all of our old bottles and put all of our yeah. new bottles with the new label and everything. So we have started... Oh, okay. Our legacy at the Nearest Green Distillery. Um, we are really proud to have our home to where we honor um, Nearest Green there. We welcome in people from all over the country 
uh, every Thursday through Sunday. Um, we have 323 uh, beautiful acres in Chevyville, Tennessee. Um, our tours are rich in history. Of course, Near Screen will always be the highlight and the primary focus. But we talk about all things Tennessee, things that mm. some people mm. may not, um, a lot of people didn't realize was made or started in Tennessee. We pay homage to the Women's Suffrage March and highlight uh, those women who mm. made a way for us, for me, um, to have the ability to vote as a female. And so it's just rich mm -hmm. in history. I encourage everyone, if you have the opportunity, to please come visit Near Screen Distillery. It truly is um, a destination spot, a place that you won't forget visiting. It is not your typical distillery tour it's the fact that it sits on 323 acres like that seems yeah it vast. was um a very historic and beloved tennessee walking horse farm and so mm -hmm. we've tried really hard to maintain the beauty of that farm uh we only took down just a few buildings um they were old uh dilapidated um barns but we uh, refurbished that wood on the property, and we still have Tennessee walking horses there on the property as well. What's a walking horse? I've, I've never heard that Thank term. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, it is different. Um, I forget what it is bred with. Um, it's two horses uh, from different breeds that mm. are mm. bred together, and they kind of have a, a high gallop. When they walk, their their back feet, back um, hoofs doesn't really move, but the front are high gaping. Uh, oh, wow. You you huh. need to Google that, Jason and yeah. Joshua. Um, there is yeah. the Tennessee Walking Horse Celebration that takes place in Shelbyville, Tennessee, every year. Uh, people from around the world come to it. They bring their their horses there to compete. Um, wow. It is quite the celebration. I think it's the end of August, first part of September. Um, okay. It is something to see. It really is. I will be Googling this as soon as we get yeah, out of this interview. You have to this Google is that. Tennessee yeah. Walking Horse. Tennessee Walking Horse. And so, <laughs> we where come to our learn. Welcome Center is, that was yeah. like the show stadium. And so, we just built out to um, make it fit our needs. But when, when Fawn purchased that property, um, it was uh, a sawdust on the floor. It had stadium mm -hmm. seating. Um, but now it looks wow. quite different. Um, I would love for you guys to come down and visit. It's, it's really something to see. Yeah, we, gosh, I'm, yeah. I'm just sitting here in Virginia. It's easy peasy to get over to Tennessee. Oh, so. absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, you should come visit. You should come visit. Sure. We, like I said, we have um, sold out tours every weekend. And um, when wow. our schedule permits, Fawn and I, one of us are there signing bottles on the weekend. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's nice. awesome. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Um, but before we get too far away from the, the blending story, I, I did have a question. You used a word in, in something, I uh, in an interview I read with you, and it immediately made me think of Stephanie McLeod, you know, master blender mm -hmm. with, uh, with the Bacardi brands. And it's a word that regular listeners of the podcast know that Joshua hates. And yet Stephanie McLeod uses it. You use it, right? People that we respect. The word smooth. And so we, we continually have this debate on the podcast. Sometimes our listeners write in with questions as well. I think Joshua may be coming around to smooth having a place in whiskey. I'm, I'm getting there. I'm right? getting there. But, but as, getting as a standalone, it, it doesn't necessarily work. What do you mean when you use smooth, Victoria? What's that conveying for you in the whiskey experience? Well, for me, you know, I certainly think it has, it has a, that, that word has a place. For me, it's a good mouthfeel, right? 
Um, mm-hmm. it, it goes down without a, a pungent burn. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Kind of like mm-hmm. eating a good dessert. It, you, you know, with each bite of the dessert, you yearn for more. Mm, That's what yeah. smooth whiskey is to me. Um, mm. it, 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 it makes you yearn to, to have another sip, to, to maybe okay. uh, create another cocktail with it. Um, mm. It's just a full embodiment of, um, of a quality whiskey. Well, and certainly mouthfeel is something we we discuss all the time yeah. in our own cast selections, and we talk about oily and unctuous and viscous. Yes, but we but we never go as far as smooth. It it just makes Joshua irate. He seems calm today, but it, it really well, well hopefully really grinds his what gears. I shared uh, <laughs> with the analogy of the dessert. Uh, it makes Joshua think a little bit different. Uh, does it make, well, it made does me hungry is what it does did. Does that make sense, Joshua? <laughs> it, you know, when, when, you do, when you compare smooth to mouthfeel, that, that makes perfect sense to me, right? Because, you know, at, where you talk about finish and that being something that's so key to your experience or, or so key to what you consider to be a, a great whiskey... For for both Jason and I, it's it's mouthfeel. Mm-hmm. If you don't have a great mouthfeel, yeah, it's that that you lose the experience there as well. And so I definitely see the connection of smooth to mouthfeel. And when I think about dessert, right? What what are the things that I love in a dessert? If it's ice cream, it's that creamy texture yes. along with flavor. If it's like a good pie or mm-hmm. something, you want that like soft, warm, buttery crust yes. and like. It is all textural that it's that texture to flavor combination getting delivered to you yeah. that, that I, yeah. that I like about dessert. And if you, and that's how you think about smooth, I'm a okay with that. Cool. I'm a-okay cool. With that. <laughs> I love it. I love, I love it when we can all be on the same page. <laughs> so, so that, that was my question just to kind of round off the, the blending yeah I, I use the word smooth a lot and and yeah. and and, mm. and it's because of the reasons that I just shared you know the the yeah. again the finish uh is my thing um but the full um experience of drinking whiskey it mm. all comes together starting with the the nose, then the palate, then the finish. It all has to work uh, together mm-hmm. to make it a good product. Absolutely, yep, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And we've, we've talked in, in numerous places about we'll do the nose test and if a sample doesn't pass the nose, it doesn't advance yeah. to the mouth. That's right. Because if it doesn't have yeah. the nose, there's yeah. no point going on. That's right. It could have the most amazing flavor or finish in the world. If there was no nose, it's it, not a it's complete It's a complete whiskey. turn off. So, right. uh, you know, so so the nose for me is kind of like um, pretty landscaping. It's got to have mm. a, um, that's the entrance to the, uh-huh. to the whiskey. Uh-huh. So it needs uh-huh. to have yeah. A, yeah. A, a good nose on it uh, to invite you to want more. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You got to. Got to go through the process. A- absolutely, um, it, 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 it's your entrance in, just like uh, looking at a pretty house. The the uh, curb appeal is uh, <laughs> right? is what right. draws you in. <laughs> so the nose on the whiskey is the curb appeal for for wanting to go further to find out more about it. That makes I think that makes perfect sense. Would you then have the mouth? Would that be the vestibule? Yes, that's it. That's it, Jason. That's it. That's it. <laughs> now you're inside. Now you're we're looking inside around. and we're going to take a look around, right? <laughs> <laughs> so what would the finish be then? The finish would, would be, be the outside, you know, the backyard, all of that. Okay. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. So don't you y'all go stealing my analogy, right? No, it's all yours. You got it on wax <laughs> yeah. today. You've got but ownership of this. Sometimes I, I do use uh. analogies like that because it makes people think different. Yeah. Um, for sure. The nose mm-hmm. for me truly is what what makes you want to go further in discovering more about the whiskey. Yeah. yeah. So if the yeah. nose turns you off, you're not interested in going further. Yep. Yep. So, it, like I, I said, it, it's all of it. The nose, the palate, the finish. All of it has to be A plus 
to make it enjoyable. I will say, though, since you first mentioned the Tennessee rye coming up with wild onion, if Indiana rye can be known for having a bit of dill on it, what if Tennessee <laughs> rye became known for having a bit of wild onion? I think it, like would, you be, made me... I think it would be terrible, Jason. Oh, and see, here's the thing. One of my favorite, favorite scotches is Le Chig. And Le Chig has this, like, Funyuns note on the nose. Yes. And I so love good. it. So I good. absolutely love it. And I've only been thinking of Le Chig since you first mentioned wild onion growing with rye in Tennessee. Well, you know, I respect you, Jason, but we are not going to have that. <laughs> we are not going to do it. Ha- have you tasted our rye yet? I have not. Oh, oh no. you have got to taste it. The uncut, unfinished, uh, uh, uncut, unfiltered, rather, it is only available at the dis- distillery. It's an ex- oh, okay. distillery exclusive. But the 100 proof is out in the market. You have got to get a bottle and try it. It is really, really good. It's a different, um, it's it's different. I think you'll find it different from most rye that you've tasted. But I think you will find it enjoyable. It is 100% rye. Uh, the spice level and the sweetness um, the balance is just phenomenal. Um, okay. It's good. It's really, really good. Okay. I like rye a, a whole lot. Me and too. I, and I do like spicy rye. Yeah, um, it's but good. But I, I also like balance. It's good. It's good. Our our, our, yeah. our CEO is not a rye ga- gal um, until we until we put it on the market. So she, she, has, <laughs> she has indulged and uh, she really enjoys it. So... Um, if we can um, swing her over to the right side, I think most people will. So it's it's really good. <laughs> um, I, another aspect of of the business that I know you are very proud of, and, and I know that you you like having the opportunity to talk about it, is the Nearest and Jack Advancement Initiative. Can you can you tell us about that and, and talk about it and tell us what you're so proud of? And I know yeah. that Tracy Franklin, one of your first yeah, um, uh, participants, I am really proud I've, of I've known that. Tracy for a long time. Yeah, I am very proud of that. Uh, again, it goes back to being um, intentional about making our uh, industry more diverse, more inclusive. And as we all know, there is not uh, uh, enough people of color in this in this industry. Uh, especially in those um, positions of visibility and decision making. Mm. And so uh, Naturally Fawn was concerned about that after starting Mm -hmm. our brand. And um, so she wanted to do something to help change the narrative. And so she thought of this initiative and um, uh, then the Jack Daniel team was, was really on board with it. And we, pledge five million dollars each from you know from each of each of our brands to get this thing started uh for us five million dollars was a whole lot of money uh Mm -hmm. being Mm -hmm. that we were so new still is a lot of money because we're still only five Mm -hmm. years old but um that five million dollars was worth it to do something that had not been done before and that was um one have a partnership with this uh, this type of initiative with another brand, and then to shine a light on um, elevating the people of color, and mm-hmm. so uh, one of the the prongs of that initiative is to elevate people such as um, Tracy Fr- Franklin. We have mm-hmm. two. Well, we had two. Um, uh, mm-hmm. Byron Copeland was the first person that Jack Daniel selected and uh, Fawn selected uh, Tracy Franklin. They both are phenomenal individuals. Brian has since, or Byron, I said Byron, it's Byron Copeland. Uh, he has now taken mm-hmm. a, a, a course of uh, his position with Jack Daniel and is doing quite well. Uh, Tracy is still working. Um, she nice. came to the to this initiative with a lot of knowledge and skill anyway, mm-hmm. and she mm-hmm. has continued mm-hmm. to grow and take classes and travel and get more experience. Um, she is a phenomenal uh, young lady, and we will be hearing from Tracy Franklin for years and years and years. I'm confident of that. Yep. Yeah, but she's another person we're going to have on the podcast in 23. Oh, that's good. Uh, you will enjoy talking to Tracy. Um, 
uh, again, she's full of knowledge. Um, she loves the spirits industry. She's had to overcome some hurdles, uh, but she has done so with uh, grace and dignity. And she is just continuing to do a fantastic job uh, working in the in in the industry. I'm 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 happy to call her friend. Good, good. Hmm. I think the last time we saw Tracy was at the Keepers Banquet in New York. And she was oh, part yeah. of the address to the haggis. Yeah, she speaks. Uh, she speaks yeah. well, right? Uh, yeah, I love oh, hearing well. her speak from the podium. She. Oh yeah. She uh, she's captivating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spent a number of years with uh, Glenn Fiddick. Is yes. that correct? With she William loves Branson. Scotch. Yes, she does. Yeah. Yes, she does. No, she's great. I, I was so excited to see her get that placement, um, and and know like you the good work that she's going to do. Uh, on the mm-hmm. back of that. Absolutely, so, absolutely. Yeah, kudos for opening that door, and, and I'm glad she got to walk through it. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Fawn, Fawn made a wise choice uh, in selecting Tracy, as she usually does. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know how Fawn does it, but she has a knack for uh, selecting the right person. Um, it, mm-hmm. It's just one of those things that she has a, a, a sense for. And once mm-hmm. she um, selects that person or approves that person to be in that position, she lets you work it the way you uh, deem fit uh, to use your own personality, to put your own spin on it, to find your own way, you know. And so it's yeah. really good to work for a company, to um, work and build this family that we have with Uncle Nears Premium Whiskey Team while being your authentic self. Um, mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. a beautiful mm-hmm. thing that you don't have to switch up uh, to um, fit in. Everyone on our team, you know, we just embrace you as you are and let you do your thing in the way in which you, you think it's, it's the best way to do it. It's certainly working. It is definitely working. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I have to applaud and, 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 um, Elevate Fawn for that. I've talked about her a lot on this podcast, but she deserves that. Um, she is truly the, the the leader of our of our of our squad here at Uncle Nears Premium Whiskey, and uh, we follow her lead. And um, she sets the example, and we are very fortunate for who she is and um, what she embodies and what she believes. Um, I think our whole team has benefited from that. Have grown. Uh, not as not just as uh, people working in the industry, but personally as well. I certainly know that I have. I am um, I am 15 years her senior, and I have learned so much from Fawn, and um, I'm grateful for that. I really am. Awesome, yeah, really beautiful. awesome. I'm trying to be uh, respectful of your of your time. Do you have another? Do, do you have another five, 10 minutes? Absolutely. Um, so, so here you are five years into this and gone from strength to strength. There was a, there was a, there was a quote from you in an article, which I really loved, which was, you know, people were just sitting on the sidelines waiting for you, for you to fail. That's and in the press said, release. Right? That's in the press release. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's right. It just came out. And you said, well, you can all stop that. waiting. You can stop <laughs> waiting. <laughs> just, you can stop waiting. You can stop waiting, right? So, <laughs> so here you are. You've, you really have grown from strength to strength. And, and it's, it's been remarkable. And, and so I guess, what are you looking forward to with the next five years? What, what, is, what is Uncle Nearest going to look like? And what has you excited for the future? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is our distillery. Mm. I am excited to continue for it to grow, to continue for us to uh, welcome in visitors from all walks of life every every weekend. Looking forward to growing it to where we are doing tours every day of the week. Um, <laughs> looking forward mm. to us opening up the longest bar in the world. Uh, <laughs> it's called Humble Baron. It is finished. We are holding uh, special events in there. Uh, It will be opening up for the public in the spring. I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm excited (laughs) that we never rest on um, 
what we have done thus far, always look into the future. Uh, Fawn is a visionary. Uh, she lays out the plan and we jump on board. I don't know, of course, what where we will be in five years, but I can mm. almost promise that, you know, we will continue to grow. We will continue to uh, add more extensions. There is a wall at the distillery with each one of our expressions that lines that wall. Mm -hmm. We've got a long way to go to fill that <laughs> up, right? And so uh, I'm yeah. looking forward to adding more expressions to um, the already beautiful premium whiskey uh, lineup that we that we have. Um, mm -hmm. Looking forward to offering um, a barrel program to, to individuals, to groups who want it. Beauty. Um, we've got a lot in store, um, but but this I can promise for sure. We are not going anywhere. So, yeah, people can stop, stop looking for us to fail. Um, we are building out a brand to outlive us all. You know, sure. Um, sure. we still have a lot of ground to make up. We're still trying to mm -hmm. uh, share the story and and introduce people to Uncle Near's Premium Whiskey. Five years from now, 10 years from now, you know, the hope would be that most people know. And um, instead of having to share the story all the time, uh, when we mention <laughs> Nears Green or somebody out there mentions Nears Green, they will know who he is. Yeah, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, they will yeah. know who he is. Now, granted, as I said at the start of this podcast, I have not grown old not one minute of sharing this story of sharing um, who we are, the brand and talking about our team and our, our, our awesome leader, Fawn Weaver, um, our distillery. I do not grow tired of doing that, but I'm hopeful that one day <laughs> it won't be necessary. Now, whether that's five years oh, from now, I don't go. know, but, um, you know, I would like to think that in years to come, when people are talking about those icons in the whiskey business, like uh, especially Tennessee whiskey, like uh, Jack Daniel and George Dickel and, mm. and Jim Bean, that um, mm -hmm. when they're talking about those folks, that Near Screen's name will be included in those conversations. And so yeah. that that is our goal, yeah. Yeah. is that uh, one day, one day, near screen will be included in those iconic conversations that he will take his right, rightful place um, in, 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 in having um, a spot in those conversations. So that is why we do what we do. Uh, we pound mm -hmm. the rock every day. We share this beautiful story. We pour this awesome uh, premium whiskey we welcome in visitors at the Nears Green Distillery in Shelbyville, Tennessee, all to elevate and shine a spotlight on this once enslaved man who deserves um, a place in Tennessee whiskey history. That is worth drinking to, Victoria. I will happily drink that to that with Absolutely. 100% rye. <laughs> yes, you got to get you some 100% rye. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, yeah, that's cheers great. to yeah. you. Cheers to Uncle Nearest. Thank cheers you. to the entire team. Thank you so uh, much. It has been a pleasure to share brilliant. with you guys today. Uh, I look forward to uh, one day meeting you face to face. And uh, maybe we can uh, have a glass of Uncle Nearest premium whiskey at the longest bar in the world. Uh, <laughs> so this is your invitation. You uh, come visit <laughs> me yeah. at, Uncle, at, at the Nearest Green Distillery. Uh, you won't regret it. Awesome. Oh, Deal. Thanks ever so much. Deal. Thank yeah, you, guys. Thank you. I hope you have a fantastic rest of the day and um, enjoy the holidays. Merry Christmas to you and your family. Oh, it's uh, awesome. Likewise. Cheers. Cheers. Sincere thanks to Victoria for taking time to sit down and talk with us. We didn't say it leading into the interview, but took a little bit of time to get Victoria on the schedule. Mm -hmm. Her timing, our timing, 
her availability, <laughs> our availability. It took a little bit of time, but so worth it. And and many times, many times through the interview, she made reference to we're family, we're friends, right? Mm. We're we're in this together. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I I really for somebody who came from a a, a legal background into this whiskey industry. I think she already represents the aspect of this industry that you and I like the most, mm. which is the friendliness, the camaraderie, the the team of this, right? Yeah. We, we are in this. And I, I thought she was incredibly welcoming. It's interesting, as much as we recorded it over Zoom, I felt welcomed into her home <laughs> where she was recording it. Yeah. yeah. And right. And it's, yeah. it's not a, it's not a sense that I always get. Um, and you know, we, we talked to lots and lots of wonderful people, but I really felt like we were sitting around her kitchen table having that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It really, it, I, I like the way you framed that too. Right. You know, when we're doing these zoom interviews, which we have been doing since the beginning of COVID and continue right. to do. And that's just life now. You know, you're always looking at people through those rectangular boxes and it's <laughs> difficult to see them outside of those rectangular boxes. But how should I say this? It's almost like seeing, going to see a movie with a famous actor and that actor is so good, you forget that, you forget their name. <laughs> they now have the name of that character, you know what I mean? And that was that feel, you know, the the rectangular boxes kind of went away and, and got out of the way and we were oh, able absolutely to, they you know went what away. I mean? Like yeah, that, abso- that's, that's, absolutely. that's the connection I'm trying to make there, yeah. Yeah, no, 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 I, that's, that's my absolute point here, my point of reckoning. So here, listen to this, I'm, I'm being oh I'm being a naughty boy I'm I'm breaking a plastic seal All right. while recording oh oh that's that's really that's really catching it in that interview Victoria had implored us mm-hmm. to pick up some Uncle Nearest Rye that she did and I and I most certainly did not have any and so I have most certainly picked it up and this for the very first time. Ooh, there's a happy noise there. Oh man! All right, so I've got a, I've got to get my bottle then, right, Jason? Absolutely. Now, to, just to be You've fair, you already opened yours, though, right? I, I have, and I want to make the. I'm, I'm about. I'm looking at it right now. Um, I want to be very clear. She implored us to purchase a bottle, which is what we did. We weren't gifted a bottle. We were not sent a bottle. These are our bottles that we paid our <laughs> money on. Yeah, I thought I would hold out, you know, that invitation to come to the come to the farm, come to that what 300 acre setup, right? To see what they've got going on there and I thought, "Oh, we'll pick up something while we're there." And I thought, "Ah, you know what? I, I think if we're kicking off season 7 and we're talking about this this rye that we were sent to to purchase." Mm-hmm. And now to 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 Victoria's point, this this remains a sourced product of theirs. Oh, wow. That was me rubbing the spirit into my hands. So if you hear a rubbing of my hands, it's with mm-hmm. spirit. Oh, trust me, Jason. Our listeners know the sound of your hand rubbing. It's just like that. <laughs> I hate to tell you this, that's not my hand. <laughs> Hundred percent rye mash bill. Yes, yes, sir. Man, bottled at a hundred proof. Definitely has a sweetness to the nose that I that I don't normally get. Yeah, and that's so. I've I've had my bottle open for a little bit now, and that was one of the things that I noticed too. It's at least on the outset, you don't get that that peppery quality. There's there's nothing overly dill like which and again this is 100% rye Correct. this is not the, the 95.5 rye that that most people correct. know Correct. 
The thing I was going to add on the back of the bottle here mm. is on the back label, under the government warning, product of Canada, aged in New York and Tennessee, mm -hmm. aged and bottled by nearest green distillery, Shelbyville, Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Like that's good layers of transparency. Yeah. Oh, man, I'll tell you, look, can I tell you something really quickly while we're enjoying this whiskey? There was something that I, that I really quite liked hearing Mitch Wilson say. So, as you know, I, I spent a few days with Mitch Wilson of Black Tot, who we had on the podcast a couple years ago now. And and we're, we're going around teaching people about rum. And one of the things that he hates is when you've got a rum blend and they... They, all they talk about is their secret recipe. He's like, mm -hmm. secret mm -hmm. recipes are worth nothing. They're shit. I don't like them. <laughs> and so that's why with Black Tot, you know, they, they're very open about their transparency. Yes, yes, yes. And so as he's going through this and, and talking about one of the components of his rum, the Guyanese rum that has the coloring in it because that's Guyana's tradition to do that. His comment was, this is transparency. Transparency isn't always what you want it to be or expect it to be. Transparency is simply <laughs> transparency. <laughs> and I really, really liked that. I thought that that was smart, great, a really good way to look at it. And then you could talk, yeah, at yeah. least you know about it, and then you can talk about it. So I like the level of transparency that they that they're giving on the backs of their bottles. Yeah, agreed. To to the whiskey, it's so soft. I'm almost getting a a marshmallow, yeah, vanilla kind of thing going on here. This this does not taste like like any rye I've had. Mm. And, and, and remember in our interview, Victoria was talking about having a sweet tooth and liking mm -hmm. flavors on the sweeter side of things. Yeah. It's so interesting to have a rye that can reflect that palate. Yeah, for me there's it's I get that nut, that sweet nuttiness going on that almost like mm, like a nougat. Yeah, like like a nougat it. or you know that you make a nice pie like a praline pie where all the you get some of that burny, those burny bits, that burnt caramel thing going on there, which is real nice. Yeah, Jason. I've got a good product on her hand. And, right, this is solid. Did you pick up any of their other uh, whiskeys? Any, any bourbon? No, nope, I'm saving my pennies for being at the distillery and see what there they've got on go. site. There you go. That's a smart answer. I like that. <laughs> you? Did you blow your budget? <laughs> I, di I didn't blow my budget, but I was able to try Uncle Nearest at um, uh, Whiskeys of the World, San Francisco. Hmm. Not 2022, back in 2021. That was one of the first tables that I went to because, you know, as nice of an event as it is, there were few whiskeys that I got to taste. So I, I went to Uncle Nearest first. And then Elijah had come to me and he had said, hey, have you tried this Bespoken stuff, right? So then I went to check mm. out the Bespoken mm -hmm. table, mm -hmm. which was another range of whiskeys I hadn't had. So, and, and here we are now having both people from Bespoken <laughs> and people from Uncle Nearest on the podcast. <laughs> it's funny how that works in our life. Uh, do you know what's... Uh, I shouldn't say this on wax. All right. All right. Let me let me temper my own comment here. It has a nose that represents the softness of single malt. Oh, I love that. That's a really that's a really good comment because I think it talks to one of the larger the larger elements of the single malt drinker's palate where more often than not a single malt drinker will like rye whiskey a bit more than they will like bourbon. There's a connection to those two spirits. And I think it goes the other way as well. Those that really prefer rye seem to enjoy some of the different flavors mm. that are coming out of single mm. malt. So I really like that, Jason. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the interview. I thoroughly enjoyed getting to speak with Victoria Edie Butler, learning more about her own family history, uh, getting back to her great great grandfather, and now getting a chance to taste someone's palate mm. really means a lot to me as well. And and I am I'm, I'm really excited to get the distillery, taste their own liquid. You know, taste what they're laying down for Victoria yeah. to be blending with, mm. to be vatting uh, releases from. So, yeah, I, I, I made this comment. You, you talked a second ago about recently spending time with Mitch. And so my tasting society up on the Palouse in eastern Washington, northern Idaho, just did a new kids on the scotch block tasting. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I always find with with established drinkers that when you when you share with them the new, there's a hesitancy, right? Well, well, the new doesn't taste like the old, and and the new isn't familiar like the old is. <laughs> and one of the things that I wanted to communicate to my tasting group was, you're at the forefront of upcoming. Scottish history. Yes. Right? Yes. <laughs> right. Right. As you sit there tasting Talisker and Highland Park and Bowmore, you're tasting old Scottish history, and and that's that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But now you're you're at the precipice of what will become established history, mm-hmm. and and don't compare it to what it's not. Enjoy it for what it is. And as as you and I sit here and we've got this uncle nearest rye, this is the Canadian rye. Yeah. At some point in the future, there will be a an uncle nearest distilled on site rye. Yeah, exactly. And and it's a journey. And and just like it boggles my mind that that Kilhoman pulled off their journey as successfully as they did. Mm-hmm. It was so easy to have, easy is the wrong word in in the way I'm going to use it. It would have been easy to poo-poo a new Isla distillery back in 2005. Sure. Right? But I wonder if the reopening of Brookladdy softened that blow. I wonder if, Hmm. I wonder if Kilhoman had happened before Brookladdy people would have said, oh, no, we don't need a distillery on Isla. Like, what's what's that all about? Yeah, I don't know. We have this storied history. You've also got the closing of Port Ellen. Maybe, maybe Isla is a microcosm of a, <laughs> of a different version of the Scotch whiskey industry. Yeah, I, I think you're... I think you're up too close to it. I think you need to step back <laughs> and, and realize that these distilleries were small parts of a much larger wave coming through and the timing was right. And the investors saw it and, and, and helped. So that, let me, yeah. let me get to the part that I'm, let me get to what I'm trying to say. Okay. okay. The, the intro, the intro didn't work. Let okay. me get to the part yeah. I'm trying to say. Yeah. Make it work this time, Jason. Right. I'll make it work. So uncle Carl, who's, who's the boots on the ground for the, for the Palouse whiskey society. I was running over the five whiskies with him and and he said, OK, this this Toro Vague um, is on Sky. And I said, yeah. And he said, are they trying to be Talisker? Mm. And I and I said, I said, one of the wonderful things about all of these new distilleries is they're just trying to be themselves. Yeah. They they are not trying to be anybody because it's. It makes no sense, right? Mm. Like if you're if you're Aaron, you don't want to try to be Highland Park. If you're Colholman, you don't want to try to be Lagavulin. If you're Tora Vig, you don't want to try to be Talisker. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's never going to work if that's your goal. Mm-hmm. Um, he, you know, also in the tasting was Lock Lee. And so mm-hmm. Lock Lee in Ayrshire, you know, in the Lowlands. Okay, are they are they a typical lowland? Well, a bit like Holyrood, that's not really their goal. Like they're not yeah. setting out yeah. to be a lowland whiskey. They're being they're setting out to be a good 
farm distillery that distills in Ayrshire. Like, it's not, to them, they're not aiming for the category. Their geography is what their geography is. Hmm. And then they're making the best whiskey they can based (laughs) based on what they have available to them. Like, their own barley. So, I've loved everything that you've said here. And there's things that I want to add to it. But I want to make sure I'm understanding the connection of this statement to Uncle Nearest. How, Mm. what are you, what's that connection? Can you reconnect it? Yeah. We're sitting here on the precipice of history. Yeah. With Uncle Nearest as a burgeoning distillery. There you go. Right? Like. Yeah. You're at the beginning point. It's easy to poo-poo the new. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's another thing to embrace it. It's another thing to understand what that historical point looks like yeah. when you're living in it. It's like the question you started us off with in the podcast. Does it feel like seven years? Well, what does seven years feel like? Right? There's a time we were new. There's a time we we're not new. There's a time we're looking back <laughs> on our first episode. <laughs> uh-huh. And there was a time when we recorded our first episode trying to look into the future as to what this might become. Mm. And all we had really done was look as far as episode two. <laughs> and after episode two, we looked as far as episode three. Yeah. Now we're planning seasons, right? Yeah, or at yeah. least half seasons, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, what does the first half of season seven look like? Who do we have? What's lined up? Where are we going mm-hmm. here? So, you know, this is all very exciting, but it's so easy to lose focus yeah. and to miss context when you're in the middle of it. So that... That leads perfectly into what I was, what I wanted to be saying is you, you had said from the outset that you were telling all the people within your society that, that, that you guys are at the forefront of this, yet you're poo-pooing the new. But what took them from the beginning to now the forefront? And it was that discovery of flavor that you guided them through. And of course, you know, they're all on their own individual journeys. But I guarantee early on in their whiskey lives, their whiskey discovery lives, all they were doing was following flavor and would had far less of a chance poo-pooing something new because all of it was new to them. And so I think... Exactly. Right? So you want to remind those people. And when I say those people, I don't mean like your society. I'm, I'm saying the, the, the whiskey veterans writ large that... What took you to where you are now? What was it? It was flavor. Still explore flavor. Don't keep fishing within the same pond. There's other ponds to be fishing. There's all dis- sorts of distilleries popping up here in the U.S. and Scotland. There's 58 distilleries in Ireland now when there was maybe 12 just a few years ago. So keep following flavor. Keep supporting these distilleries that are giving us new flavors. If you love whiskey so much, support brands. Get behind them. And that's the interesting part for me is is when you say you love whiskey and then you taste a new distiller, a new distillery, what what do people always say? And and we've experienced this at at festivals all the time. Like I wish it it was younger. It like tastes it, young. It tastes right? too old. It, it tastes too old. I wish it were younger. <laughs> right? Everybody wants to say it tastes young. Yeah, yeah. It's like, gosh, I wish we could just pour everything blind and have real conversations. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Mm-hmm. Ah, anyway, was that, anyway, wait, anyway, was anyway. Was that anyway, segment anyway. brought to us by uh, What's Grinding My Gears? i'm really glad that i could open that rye with you and we could taste it right after the the playing of the victoria ed butler interview which i thoroughly enjoyed i had a hellacious cold at the time wasn't tasting anything and so to be sitting here uh at the dawn of season seven oh yeah tasting tasting uncle nearest rye with you yeah, it's good. Yeah. So here, there's there's a wee toast. Here's to here's toast. to Victoria, here's to Uncle Nearest. Uh, here's to being on a journey into history. Uh, power to you all. Cheers. Cheers to that. You and I, Jason, we have a, a bunch of smaller things to talk about, but we all know small things pile up and turn into big things. 
right? They do with us. They really do. That and so, is true. And so I think this warrants a visitation. <laughs> Who do we normally get visited by? Elijah. I was thinking <laughs> Passover as opposed to... I'm a mum, 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 mum. <laughs> yeah, let's pull out Elijah's chair. Let's open the door. I wonder if that's... And invite in the paper boy. invite in the paper boy. <laughs> who this week is played by Frank Zappa. <laughs> Moving to Montana soon. Extra, extra. We all are bad. Life story of Playboy Penny. Extra, extra. There's a couple of quick things, Jason, that I wanted to bring up, but I don't want to belabor the point because we're going to have some supporting tasting Doesn't sound videos. Like you. Go easy. Go easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we had mentioned in uh, our last Extra Extra episode, which is now YouTube Exclusive. Indeed it is. Oh gosh, is it ever? Yeah. You see our faces. Oh, Go with, Jason, I know that that's what you want to talk about. We're not there yet. Let me have the floor still. I know you want to talk about it. Everybody gets to see your face and how lucky they are. I need a haircut are. before the next recording. I tell you, I saw an old recording of us with you in, in full Gandalf cosplay. It was amazing. Mm. Uh, I miss those days, Jason. If I'm being honest. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so we we had teased our 14 year old North British on our last episode of Extra Extra YouTube. Yeah, indeed, episode uh, 14 years. Well, basically 13 years in refill bourbon, and then it spent 14 months in a f- in first fill PX Spanish oak wood. And turned the yeah. liquid from a pale straw color to a dark as night, why did everybody turn the lights out color. And it did that without hiding the grain and made a sherry bomb bourbon-like grain whiskey that will tick everybody's boxes. I'm so excited. Say for this no one. more words. Those okay. are all the words. Okay. I love good. all of those good, good, words. Good, good. And I will return to that really quickly in one second. We're going to be, and the reason why I'm going to return to that is along with that 14-year-old North British, come this Thursday, which is tomorrow, the day after this episode uh, launches. So what is that? February 23rd is, February 22nd is when this launches. Come February 23rd, along with the North British, we're launching our first ever Call, well, I don't want to call it that. French brandy distilled and matured for a better part of its life in the cognac region of France. So, so here's an interesting part of that, yeah. that that you had told me and I, I passed along to somebody else, yeah. which was we, you're correct, it is, it is distillate from the cognac region of France yeah. that we did not want to call cognac because it had been matured in X Scotch whiskey barrels. Mm-hmm. And you were saying that alone didn't stop it from being cognac. No, I had thought that it was far less that. That that was fine. Our understanding is that it's fine. Then we had that thought or had been told that if cognac is matured and bottled outside of the cognac region, then legally you can't call it cognac. And then we spoke with you. Allah are thinking about scotch. Right? Yeah, right? exactly. Because those are scotch parameters. Those are scotch parameters, so they made sense, right? You can't bottle scotch whiskey in Ireland and call it scotch. It's now malt whiskey from Scotland. You know, it's not scotch whiskey. Anyway. Indeed. And then we found out from someone else, they said, no, that that should be okay as far as the cognac designation goes. <laughs> what changed the cognac designation, and, and again, right, we're just getting this, we're getting this information third hand. We're trusting our friends in the industry. Uh, there was me thinking you'd been reading through regulations in French. Like, no, that's not true. <laughs> no, no, not at all. I've just been eating baguettes and uh, <laughs> just surfing the talking net. Talking to people while wearing a beret. <laughs> I haven't even talking to them. It's all been in mime, pantomime, Jason. 
The conversation sounded like this. You've never sounded better. <laughs> so the uh, so the so the other thing that we had heard was, if you take cognac and you put it into a finishing cask, then that is what breaks. That's that's the the straw that breaks the camel's back. That breaks the rules. So that part we didn't even I didn't even consider that a finishing. <laughs> well, we didn't cask, have to worry about that part. Yeah, right? at that point we didn't have to worry about it. So. So yeah, so this is <laughs> distillate from 1989, and December, December 1989, yeah, December 31st, 1989. <laughs> I love the way we, I love the way we and yes, our own, <laughs> our own year of distillation. <laughs> so so we we oh, had purchased two casks that. and quite liked them a lot, but both you and I. Our palates are, are are a bit different from a cognac palate. Like cognac and armagnac have that, and we mentioned this in a previous podcast, have that really dry finish, which is sometimes a bit too dry, at least for my palate. I don't want to fully speak for you. And uh, as I mentioned previously, Kirsty McCallum had had talked about how in the past when she had spirits that were too drying, that that mm. the practice was to take that liquid and put it into PX sherry for a period of time, not for too long, because if you like the flavor, you don't want to change it too much, but you want to get some of that juiciness back, you know, get, get some of that dryness out. So we ended up taking the two casts that we had and put them into, again, just like the North British, first fill PX Spanish oak wood. And with this, it was only a nine month finish. And that's where you and I uh, said, you know what, this this is it. That gets the dryness exactly where we want it. It gives that PX sweetness coming through, but that that cognac grape, that, that the grapes is still so gorgeous. So like the North British, you know, I, I think that this is going to fit a bourbon drinker's palate and a malt whiskey drinker's palate because of that, that sweetness coming through, because of a bit of that sherry coming through. And... It's priced pretty damn well. One ninety five for a thirty two year old, nineteen eighty nine distillate French brandy. Yeah, yeah. I am. I am sitting here nodding along like a French mime. I am saving my words for the tasting mm, video. Thank you. When it goes on YouTube. Oh, that's good. But it's nosing this, sipping on this, it's a hands down drinker. There's no doubt about it. It's a drinker and a sharer. Like this is, sometimes you get bottles and you say, try this because you're like, uh-oh. But this is like, you need you need to give this a go. If you've not experienced cognac before or French brandy before, give this a go and see how beautiful it could be. And if people love this bottling, awesome. Check out other French brandies. Check, it's a, a category to be discovered. Um, yeah. yeah, there you go, man. Really tasty. I'm just sitting here sipping, <laughs> just <laughs> nodding my head and looking out the mm-hmm. window mm-hmm. in a, you know, in a reflective manner. I was really, yeah, really happy with that. That, that really came together great. But yep. like I say, full, full thoughts uh, over on YouTube. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that's the the North British 14 year old will be on the website starting Thursday, February the 23rd yep. at 115 dollars a bottle. You. Thank you. And the the French brandy finished in PX Sherry will be on the same date and it will be 195 as as Joshua says a second ago. Both of them will ship together and, and shipping will start the week of February 27. There you go. There you go. For so- those in the United States. Mm-hmm. If you're not in the United States, mm-hmm. however, we know many of you are not. We are closing in on a bottling date for our ROW Rest of the World release number four. Mm -hmm. And we will have more details about that when the time comes. We will bring Jess into the news segment to talk about casks that she will be selling around the world. But if you are in Canada, Sweden, Germany, Israel, Japan, and I believe... Joshua, the United Kingdom. Ah, yes, the United Kingdom. 
<laughs> there will be some rather tasty treats coming and uh, and we will describe those in length. Going to be remarkable, Jason. Uh, the bottlings are wild. Anyway, yes. So They are. Yeah. They are. We'll get Jess in. We'll share yeah, the excitement yeah, around that. Yeah, good. You wanted, you wanted to talk about extra, extra. I think it's something that, that we need to... To talk about a little bit, because it's kind yeah. of new to our listeners. It is. It is. Here we are. We've now got three episodes of Extra Extra recorded, released, and on the YouTube channel under Single Cask Nation. Mm -hmm. We have had a request to create a playlist of Extra Extra episodes. Yeah. So they can be easily found and easily played in order as as people who don't really live on you know <laughs> don't navigate the youtube world so much this idea of creating a playlist for for you know easy access solely to the extra extra episodes is a new concept to us it totally makes sense but because it's so new and because we know so little Really, listeners, if you have any further suggestions <laughs> on how to, you know, and how we can make our episodes a bit more accessible to you, please let us know. Questions at One Nation Under Whiskey uh, or info at Single Cast Nation. It, it really would be great. We're we're going to be growing into this, and any help that you could provide would be would be welcomed. Have you seen anybody in the comments mention that we need new timepieces because our use of tight thirty five doesn't mean anything for the final product? I think they kind of agree with us that, you know, the idea of 35 minutes, uh, time is relative, Jason. I mean, uh, Dr. Frank Einstein uh, proved that to us. Frank Einstein. I don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> Frankenstein. I, I get what you're going for there. How does, how does Dr. Frankenstein have a connection to time? Well, it's Einstein. Relative. <laughs> what was I? That was Einstein's first name. Yeah, Frank. He Frank. shortened it to Albert. You've only ever known him as Frank. Yeah. Francis. Yeah, Frank Zappa Einstein. <laughs> Moving to Montana Prince, soon. <laughs> Prince Albert, Frank Zappa Einstein. I heard Prince Albert was in a can, Jason. Anyway, uh, <laughs> it's almost saying? like we're doing an intro for Einstein <laughs> on our podcast. <laughs> Einstein. <laughs> A.K.A. Einstein five names. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. So what are we talking about? <laughs> we were talking about our extra extra episodes. So so. But let me say one more ahead, thing before do. we before we before we chug along okay. here, which is, um, for those of you who were used to the extra extra appearing in your your same feed as One Nation Under Whiskey. Obviously, we have moved it out. We have moved it off to, to YouTube. But with the move to YouTube, we have changed how we do business slightly. Mm -hmm. We now summarize a story. We present key points from a story. Mm -hmm. And we get into the riffing a, a little bit sooner. Uh, we did play a, a fun game together in episode three. But we get to the riffing. And then once we get through the riffing, we actually move on to a little bit of whiskey, a, a little whiskey chat, mm -hmm. new release, whiskey advocate, top 10 entry, um, our own bottling from the, the last one, as you said, at the beginning of this segment, mm -hmm. we did talk about the North British for, for a period of time as well. So really, it's an excuse to talk whiskey and show whiskey and frame whiskey. And uh, But you can, as I, as I alluded to a second ago, you can rest assured that we still get in and out in a tight 35. Sometimes that 35 <laughs> uses the numbers four and two or four and four or <laughs> other, but it's it's always a tight 35 in our always hearts. Always a tight, always a tight 35. We actually received a... And you can... We received a complaint from, uh, from Ollie Chilton recently. Another one? <laughs> I know. Let's see, he's just calling in with complaints at this point. Man, talk about living down to a Yorkshire stereotype. Well, so <laughs> so he uses our tight thirty fives to to go running, and and so now he's like, well, I, I can't get you on a podcast anymore to to keep running. And I said, but you can listen to 
you could just listen to the YouTube. He says, I'm not getting into that. So, uh, so there you go. Whoa. Yeah. I'm not getting into that. Wow. He's an older man than us <laughs> with, with, with that mindset. But I'll tell you, uh, it's really easy to do if, if you had been traditionally listening to Extra Extra and you're a bit apprehensive about how to consume our episodes of Extra Extra moving forward, especially if you, you listen to them on the go rather than, you know, in front of a computer or whatever, like you can listen to our episodes, just open up YouTube, press play and start your run or start your drive. Don't look at your phone. It's definitely possible to be doing that. I do it all. I do it all the time. So, so there you go. Right. And there's a, there's a note in this cognac that I can't quite put my finger on, but I'm going to continue to try to work it out before we do the tasting video. Mm -hmm. I just keep getting it. And one final, final, final bit of small news before we close out the segment. Retail release number nine mm -hmm. for Single Cast Nation continues to make its way across the country, continues to make its way to distributors, and continues to make its way to retailers who are putting it on their shelves. Please go search it out. Please go find it. Please support those retailers who are supporting Single Cast Nation. Yes. Yeah. Just to add to that, our Massachusetts listeners should know that the uh, retail release number nine just hit Massachusetts and we'll start there headed out to your favorite uh, whiskey shop shelves. So keep an eye out on that. And it's a slow rollout, but that's just the way our country works. Slow rollouts. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, cheers to everybody supporting that. ROW, the rest of the world, we haven't forgotten about you. New and exciting things coming your way that we will cover again. New and exciting being on YouTube. Please come find us. Mm -hmm. Please come subscribe. Uh, we'd, we'd love to see you over there. And Josh and I keep talking about this off air. We, we are starting the planning of it. Live extra, extra episode is in the works. Mm -hmm. And we will make an announcement for when that will be happening as well. So, you know, a bunch of new and exciting things to go with the start of season seven and, you know, and everything we've been talking about today. Yeah. Before we get out of here, I've got an important question for you. We ask all of our guests, well, not all of our guests, but a good number of our guests, you know, what are you looking forward <laughs> to in the future? I'm going to change it up for you. What do you mm -hmm. hope to accomplish in this season of One Nation Under Whiskey? It's interesting that, that, you, that you move that focus to the season of it, because ever since we spoke to Susanna Skyver Barton, mm. I've really had a focus on 2023. Mm. And obviously we, we kick off here in the, the second half of February. There's still a lot of 2023 ahead of us. But but my inspiration for 2023, and now season seven, <laughs> is to talk about grain practices, to Ooh. talk about the environment, to talk about climate change, to talk about it in real world terms. Mm. I'm, I'm exhausted by the politicalization of it. Mm. And, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm disappointed that a number of us have stopped talking about it to avoid the politicalization <laughs> of the topic. And I, I think, you know, for myself, I have been looking to talk more about who's your producer of this? How are you getting this? What's it doing to the land? Yeah. What about the people who are harvesting this? Yeah. You know, we have Westland coming up where we actually got to go to Skagit Valley. You know, you know those listening to the mailbag episode, herd is in the car going there, the herd is in the car coming back mm -hmm, from there. Mm -hmm. Right. We're in Skagit Valley. We're talking to maltsters there. How are they talking to their farmers? How are they putting? 
how are they respecting the land? Yeah. Right? How are they protecting their land? We've got an interview coming up with David Thompson from Spirit of Yorkshire. Oh, yeah, sure. And there we get into talking about the land. You know, that was an absolutely fascinating aspect of the conversation. Uh, We've got interviews lined up where we could be talking to producers Mm -hmm. and what does it look like in 2023 you know, th- this comment has has been made. If you're farming the land and you're the person who needs a return from the land to then make sure you're feeding your family, supporting your family, mm-hmm. you need that land to be healthy. You need that land to remain. What practices are you putting in place to make sure that land continues to be there yeah. for you to use to support your family. Yeah. That's not a political issue. No. That's 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 just that's a farming issue. Yes. It's yep. a production issue. Yep. It's a long term issue. Right? And so I really want to have those conversations in a meaningful boots in the ground kind of way. Yeah. I am most excited about that for season seven and, and twenty twenty three. Yeah, I, I, I love it. You know, I think similarly to you, you know, you're you're taking on this uh, this issue that you think is is important and should be discussed and shouldn't be hidden in any way. And in in a similar way I kind of feel the same. It's the the landscape of who makes whiskey who distills it, who blends it, who talks about it, who we talk to about whiskey, that landscape has changed and continues to evolve. And I like the idea of exploring that further. You know, again, back back to our conversation with Victoria Butler, we're talking about black history from the 1800s. Right. This is history we should be talking about. We're talking about we've had Pendaren on here before. We've had, um, you know, Kirsty McCallum on. You you hear how whiskey is done through the lens of of a female and what that does to flavor. And, you know, again, back to your point, none of this is political. These are the people making the stuff. These are the people selling the stuff. Let's talk to them. It's not just white guys like you and me. It's 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 everybody. Granted, the vast majority of people look like you and me, but we hear them all the time. And 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 there's larger stories to be telling. Back to your your point about you know your your drinkers um, in your Palouse whiskey society. You know you you can get stuck on the same old distilleries, or you can explore and, and discover more things. Like we could still right. just talk to, to the white dudes in the industry or we can discover all the other shit that just happens to be going on and hearing great stories and, and having conversations with Victoria, having conversations with Susanna Skyver Barton. Right? All of these are very important. And it's not coming from a political place. It's coming from a place of this is whiskey. This is what whiskey looks like. Let's highlight it. That's all. Absolutely. Yep. Yep, excited for that as well. I think I think season seven will be will be rather tickety boo. Mm-hmm. With that said, I want to close mm-hmm. where we opened. Oh right, which yes. I said I would return to Ryan Fifley's email, mm-hmm. and here we are returning to it. And it's the comment he made, and these are Ryan's words. I was fascinated by how the Scotch climate and culture created their whiskey. Now it's my mission to see what kind of whiskey will result from my farm and our climate. I'm curious on your perspective on that. As as somebody, when he came into whiskey, Mm. were you thinking climate and culture when you got into whiskey? Did Did it grow along the way? Did it... Did it appear one day? How, how, how do you think about climate and culture with something like Scotch 
and other whiskies besides. Yeah, I mean, first coming into it, it was just this this was a product that the Scots made and I like it. And it sort of went as far as that and then I would dig into distilleries, dig into blends and single casks and things like that. Yeah, I, I wonder I wonder how much of that issue is is part inside baseball thinking, right? Because as a producer, these are things that you do need to think about, right? Your climate and your surroundings and how that affects things. And But as one gets deeper and deeper into the whiskey journey, again, back to your drinkers and your Palouse Whiskey Society, they're, they're thinking about whiskey in a different way. And you've got distilleries like Arden Merck and, and Nick Neen talking about sustainability and and things and you've got the UK government looking at the sustainability of peat you know it's all sort of really in, important things so now I, I at this point I definitely think about that all the time I do wonder if I think about it all the time because we are part of that inside baseball game we are within the industry we just happen to be also talking about it and sharing our stories with those outside of the industry. And so I wonder, you know, if we're talking about issues or things we want to accomplish with this episode, does that become one of them where we're championing these ideas, like you had said, back back mm-hmm. to grain and what that's doing, mm-hmm. what climate mm-hmm. could be doing to grain? Man, that's, 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 a, that's a deep question that has me thinking aloud more than I'm actually... Like, I've never just sat and really thought about it. But when we start talking about it, then I can process it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think season seven, climate and culture, yeah. could summarize what we're trying to achieve climate this year. And culture, there you go. <laughs> I like that, climate and culture. Right? Yeah. I, I, I think it's there. So yeah, I think it's lovely. So outside of what you said previously... Uh, when I had asked you your question, and then you posed the question from uh, Michelle Pfeiffer here. Um, was it Ryan Pfeiffer? Yes, Ryan that, Pfeiffer. that was my first. I thought we were coming from American Tale here. Uh, <laughs> Pfeiffer, <laughs> Pfeiffer goes to Montana. <laughs> I think that was the fourth movie. Oh my God, I can hear all the xylophones going on. But uh, what, what, what is your... What's your answer to that? Oh my gosh, he's still going. Underneath the flower, then we'll be together. A whole bunch of stray cats have just shown up at my door here. A whole bunch of them. Somewhere out there. Out <laughs> and I was still going? Does I... Okay. Uh, what's your own answer to that to that question? The thoughts on on climate and and culture. Yeah. Culture never once struck me yeah. when I when I started my journey. Culture. Yeah. I lived in Scotland. Yeah, you were part I of the culture. Scottish. <laughs> culture never struck me. Yeah. Never struck me. Wasn't a part of it. Mm. Um it was it was a liquid in a bottle mm. that that we made in parts of Scotland. It huh. it was absolutely a commodity. It was not a a cultural um, I'm going to say item, but there's another word I was really grasping for there. It, it just it just wasn't connected to to the people. Um, climate, no, not not a thought in my head. Absolutely hmm. not. It it was a in my early discovery. It was the flavors of it. Yeah. Right. Yep, and so exactly. I think it's been interesting, and and this is always a conversation that we have. Which, you know, a number of people asking me, the Scotsman, like, oh, single malt in Wales, eh? Single malt in England, eh? Oh, single malt in India, eh? I love it all. Bring it all on. Mm -hmm. Why? Because it makes the Scots better. I think we now talk about climate better because we've, we've experienced it when single malt gets made in India, when it gets made in Israel, right? When it gets made in, in America, yeah, right? It's given us an opportunity to reflect on what we've been doing in Scotland for over two centuries, right? And, and, and I feel like for me at the end of the 20th century, 
I was just simply living in a place where Scotland made scotch. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. And, there was there yeah. was nothing more to it, right? Now, what has always interested me okay. is the historical context for scotch. Uh, the fact that you were back then you were always dealing with an age statement. So you were always drinking something that was obviously yeah. made in the past. Yeah. Right? It, it wore that <laughs> as a, a badge of pride. Yeah. Right? This was made 18 years ago. This was made 12 years ago. And I always think when you're starting your journey, you're starting with whiskeys that were made before you were a drinker, right? <laughs> like not even you hadn't uh-huh. got into the category, you weren't even a drinker. Yeah. And so there, so you're kind of like, oh, shit, this was made when I was eight years old. Gosh, when I was eight years old, I didn't have a thought in my head about drinking whiskey. Like, and now here I am drinking that product. Yeah. And then always thinking about, okay, who, who distilled it? Who filled the cask? Who rolled that into its place in the warehouse? Right. Always thinking about those people mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. the day they'd put in and the money they'd made and you know, how did they relax at the end of their shift? And like I always, always, always thought about the people within the historical context, okay. but I wasn't thinking climate. I certainly wasn't thinking culture. Oftentimes because Scotch was trading in the kilts, shortbread, tartan and bagpipes, right? Yeah. And in your day-to-day dealings in Scotland. Nah, you might have shortbread with a cup of coffee, yeah. but you're not really living those day in no. and day out. Yeah, it's something that and kind so, of made you roll your eyes a bit. Right. right. Yeah. So Scotch culture felt like it was the culture that we exported to to other corners of the world where people really dug Scotsmen in kilts playing oh, bagpipes. Yeah. That's that's what sold. Um Right. You know, it's it, it's interesting. Scotland is known for, I mean, that it's such a big part of your economy, Scotch whiskey. Bourbon is a pretty big part of the American economy. Not not as big as, as it is for, for Scotland, but it's pretty damn big. But I didn't get into whiskey until my 30s. And when I was getting into whiskey, I was not looking for American because I grew up on the thought that American whiskey was Jack Daniels. And Jack Daniels was rock cut. That's just the thought that I had going into it. I don't know where that thought came from, but it, it just was a thought. <laughs> so I never really, I never really even considered or even thought about the culture of American spirits uh, no. At, at, no. at all. I went straight to Scotch whiskey. So you know, it, it's it's interesting. I have such a disconnect despite loving bourbon and loving rye and having bottled bourbon and rye alongside uh, you, you know, there's always been that disconnect with me and my palate to American whiskey. It's always been scotch whiskey first, malt whiskey is a larger category second, and then you go down from there. And so I just, I never had that thought. I didn't care about it. Just didn't, didn't have a place in my life. Yeah, we could we could really go down the rabbit hole on. I, I really want to unpack this more. I hope this is a theme we return to uh, as the season goes along. I, I my final comment is going to be that I I love when we talk about Scotch culture now that it it looks and sounds completely different <laughs> than it did two and a half decades there ago. You go. I, I love seeing that evolution. You know, it, you know, we, we, we sometimes talk about people we would love to interview. Um, I'm really eager to get Emma Walker on the podcast. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the, the woman who took over for Jim Beveridge to be in charge of Johnny Walker. <laughs> right. You know, the world's <laughs> largest whiskey brand, Right. I'd love to just talk to her and get a, again, get a sense of that journey. What brought you here? What guides you? Like, that's Scotch whiskey culture as we sit here in 2023. Amazing. And that's, and right back to what we were saying, it's this issue we keep on returning to. And that's a woman guiding that. 
I love that. Right? It's, it's, 100%, it's, it's yeah. so, yeah. it's very, very cool. So yeah, so let's make that a goal. Speaking of goals of season seven, let's see if we can get Emma Walker on here. Do you hear that, Diageo workers? Connect us, please. <laughs> Diageo workers. <laughs> <laughs> they knew who they are. Uh-huh. Page and Google. Page and Google. <laughs> Google knows who he is. <laughs> Ah, uh, all right, Jason. All right, Joshy. Um, I raise my glass to Victoria Edie Butler, uh, to you, of course, and to our listeners. Here's to a great season seven. I think we've got a lot to do, and I think it's going to be a hell of a ride as we do it. Yeah, hundred percent. Cheers to the listeners. No point doing any of this without any of you. Uh, Victoria is is family and, and a friend after after one conversation. I'm looking forward to seeing her in person. And Joshy, keep up the good work. We'll continue to put out these pad cost episodes. Looking forward to that. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Victoria, I'm I am so sorry, and I'm sorry to you, Jason, as well. My recording device was not recording. Not a problem. <laughs> not a problem. We'll I'm start so, over. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm so I'm, I'm so Jason glad that three, I caught it. Jason is thrilled that you made a mistake, Joshua. <laughs> <laughs> he's gonna hold this. Oh, oh now he's gonna say, "Are you sure I, you're recording?" I'm honored that you're with us today, <laughs> witnessing this moment. <laughs> like, oh, oh. Oh, I feel lighter. I it's, do feel better. It's the, it's I do. the best Starting day to get for warm Jason. Here. <laughs> oh. You make oh one mistake. Gosh. Oh my gosh! For the rest of time, oh. Joshua, you sure your equipment's running? You sure your equipment's running? Oh, oh. oh. Okay, He's let's so let, let's 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 do this one last time. We're we're going to do the elephants one last time. Okay. Apologies for that. And then, and then I'll go ahead and, and I'll re the question. Let me get a paper towel. I'm crying laughing at Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 Joshua, this day. Oh, this day. Oh. It's so funny. You know, I, I, I leaned over and what I did is I checked my, um, my volume to ensure I wasn't too much in the red. Meanwhile, I looked away and didn't didn't press record. So uh, he messed up, what Jason. I, what, I, uh, what I love about this is it's hard enough to tell a subject that you haven't hit record. Like I, between you and me, Victoria, I've done that one time without Joshua knowing, and um, <laughs> it's it's not easy to tell your subject that they've just wasted some minutes. For Joshua having to admit it in front of me as well. I, it must have been so hard for him. <laughs> we'll never forget this moment, Joshua. We'll never forget.